नमस्कार अ वॉम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन परस्पेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज साई रमज दबा एंड विथ मी इज अभिनीत शुक्ला ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शुड ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर द हेडलाइंस India reiterates its firm commitment towards deepening multilateral cooperation in areas of food and energy security and climate change. SEO member states call for open, inclusive and non-discriminatory trading system based on principles of WTO. Indian President Draupadi Murmu calls for collective global efforts to address water crisis. Suspension of UN brokered grain deal will affect food security globally. says India at UNSC Green ships leave Ukrainian ports despite Russian suspension of export deal People in Israel vote in their fifth parliamentary election in less than 4 years Polling also underway in Denmark for national elections and in cricket England defeat New Zealand while Sri Lanka beat Afghanistan in Super 12 stage fixtures of Men's T20 World Cup India to clash with Bangladesh on Wednesday now the news in detail the 21st meeting of shanghai cooperation organization seo council of heads of government was held in a virtual format on tuesday evening india's external affairs minister dr s jay shankar represented the country in the meeting in his address dr jay shankar highlighted india's strong cultural and historical connect with the seo region He reiterated India's firm commitment towards deepening multilateral cooperation in areas of food and energy security, climate change, trade and culture. He spoke about the launch of Global Mission Life, Lifestyle for Environment by Prime Minister Narendra Modi on the 20th of October and its relevance in ensuring food and energy security. The Indian External Affairs Minister drew attention to India's commitment in fighting the challenge of climate change and also its achievements made in this direction. He also emphasized India's strong recovery on the economic front after the pandemic. Dr. Jay Shankar also expressed interest in expanding India SEO trade on the basis of fair market access. A joint communique of SEO heads of government and other decisions were adopted at the conclusion of the meeting. The SCO CHG meeting was attended by SCO member states, observer states, secretary general of the SCO, executive director of the SCO regional anti-terror structure in Turkmenistan and other invited guests. The SCO member states on Tuesday confirmed their commitment to formation of a more representative, democratic, just and multipolar world order based on universally recognized principles of the international law and multilateralism. In a joint communique following the meeting of the councils of heads of government CHG of SCO member states the heads of delegations emphasized that the member states should adhere to a line that excludes bloc ideological and confrontational approaches to solving the problems of international and regional development taking into account the member states opinions they confirmed relevance of the initiatives to promote interaction in building the new type international relations in the spirit of mutual respect justice equality and mutually beneficial cooperation they expressed their support for india's chairmanship in the organization in 2022-23 the heads of delegations confirmed that the sco member states considered it important to further improve the architecture of global economic governance they said they will consistently advocate and strengthen an open transparent fair inclusive and non-discriminatory multilateral trading system based on the world trade organization principles and rules They stressed that unilateral application of economic sanctions other than those adopted by the UN Security Council is incompatible with international law principles and has a negative impact on international economic relations. They were in favor of deepening interaction in the field of digital economy and digital technologies to ensure inclusive economic growth of the SEO member states to achieve goals of the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The heads of delegations confirmed the intention of the member states to make effective use of the SCO transit potential, the formation of regional transport and transit corridors, and the implementation of major projects that contribute to strengthening transport connectivity in the organization's space. 
Indian President Draupadi Murmu has said that the water crisis is a multidimensional and complex issue that requires collective global efforts. She said the adverse impact of climate change has posed a serious challenge to water conservation. The President of India was addressing the inaugural session of the 7th edition of India Water Week in Uttar Pradesh on Tuesday. Ms. Murmu said India was facing a water crisis, but in the last few years, various schemes and plans were introduced by the central government to manage the water scarcity in the country. इस वाटर वीक के दौरान जल से जुड़े विभिन्न विषयों पर सेमिनार और अन्य कार्यक्रम आयोजन किए जाएंगे जिनमें न सिर्फ जल संरक्षण बल्कि पर्यावरण कृषि और विकास से जुड़े अनेक पहलुओं पर भी चर्चा होगी ये मुद्दे सिर्फ भारत ही नहीं बल्कि पूरे विश्व के लिए प्रासंगिक है जल का मुद्दा राष्ट्रीय सुरक्षा से भी जुड़ा हुआ है डेनमार्क फिनलैंड जर्मनी इसराइल और यूरोपियन यूनियन इस आयोजन में भाग ले रहे हैं The 7th edition of India Water Week is being organized till the 5th of November in an effort to raise awareness, conserve and use water resources in an integrated manner. The theme of the event is Water Security for Sustainable Development and Equity. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi will address the inaugural function of Invest Karnataka 2022, the global investors meet of the state through video conferencing on Wednesday. The meet is aimed at attracting prospective investors and setting up development agenda for the next decade. The three-day program being held from the 2nd to the 4th of November in the Indian city of Bengaluru would witness more than 80 speaker sessions. The speakers include some of the top industry leaders including Kumar Mangalam Birla Sajjan Jindal, Vikram Kirloskal, among others. A number of business exhibitions with more than 300 exhibitors and country sessions will run simultaneously. The country sessions will be hosted by the partner countries that is France, Germany, the Netherlands, South Korea, Japan and Australia. The global scale of the event will give Karnataka an opportunity to showcase its culture to the world. Three grain-loaded cargo vessels left Ukrainian ports on Tuesday, according to the Center overseeing the implementation of a deal brokered by Turkey and the UN. The Istanbul-based International Coordination Center said the movement of these vessels has been agreed by the Ukrainian, Turkish and UN delegations. It said the Russian delegation has been informed the ships are the latest to sail from Ukraine after Russia pulled out of a July agreement that allowed vital grain exports to leave Ukraine with the aim of alleviating global food shortages. The UN-brokered Black Sea Grain Initiative was signed during a ceremony in Istanbul in July. Under the deal, ships transporting grain from three Ukrainian ports travel along an agreed corridor to markets worldwide. At least 10 ships sailed from Ukraine's ports on Monday without incident. The agreement which established a safe corridor through which vessels could travel to Istanbul for inspection had allowed more than 9.5 million tons of Ukrainian grain to be exported. The accord is due to be renewed on the 19th of November. Russia said it was withdrawing from the export deal after it blamed Ukraine for drone attacks on its fleet in the Black Sea. Moscow also said it cannot guarantee the safety of navigation, deeming the deal as hardly feasible without its participation. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan will be speaking with his Russian and Ukrainian counterparts in the coming days to pursue efforts to keep the agreement in force despite Russia's hesitation. India has raised concern at the United Nations Security Council, UNSC, about the suspension of the UN-brokered Black Sea Grain Initiative. New Delhi said the move is likely to further worsen the food security, fuel and fertilizer supply challenges faced by the world, particularly the Global South. Speaking at the UNSC briefing debate on Ukraine, Madhusudan, counselor at the permanent mission of India to the UN, said the Black Sea Grain deal had provided a glimmer of hope for peace in Ukraine and helped contribute to lowering the prices of wheat and other commodities. India supports the engagement of the Secretary General with the parties on renewal and full implementation of the initiative, including facilitation of exports of food and fertilizer from Ukraine and Russia. The Black Sea Grain Initiative and its successful implementation over the last four months is consistent with our long-standing position that diplomacy and dialogue is the only solution to end this ongoing conflict that has resulted in serious consequences for the region and beyond. We continue to support all efforts, including that of Secretary General, to end the conflict. Let me end by reiterating that the global order is anchored on principles of the UN Charter, international law and respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states. 
The Indian diplomat said the initiative had resulted in the export of more than 9 million tons of grains and other food products out of Ukraine. They believe the exports had contributed to lowering prices of wheat and other commodities evident from the drop in the FAO food price index. This UNSC debate comes after Russia requested the meeting following its decision to suspend participation in the Black Sea Grain Initiative for an unspecified period of time announced this past weekend in response to alleged Ukrainian attacks against its ships. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a news commentary on UN Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee meeting. The counter-terror sanctioned regime of the United Nations has been effective to put countries on notice that turn terrorism into a state-funded enterprise, External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jayashankar said in an apparent reference to countries supporting terrorism. In his address at the meeting of the UN Security Council Counter-Terrorism Committee in Delhi, Dr. Jayashankar described terrorism as one of the gravest threats to humanity. He said despite efforts by the UN, the threat of terrorism is only growing and expanding, particularly in Asia and Africa. The UN Security Council in the past two decades has evolved an important architecture built primarily around the counter-terrorism sanctions regime to combat this menace, he said. This has been very effective in putting those countries on notice that have turned terrorism into a state-funded enterprise, Jay Shankar said. Despite this, the threat of terrorism is only growing and expanding, particularly in Asia and Africa, as successive reports of the 1267 Sanctions Committee monitoring reports have highlighted, he added. The External Affairs Minister said the ethos of open societies is being used to attack freedom, tolerance and progress. He also spoke extensively on the use of new technologies by terror groups, saying the internet and social media platforms have turned into potent instruments in the toolkit of terrorist and militant groups. In recent years, terrorist groups, the ideological fellow travelers, particularly in open and liberal societies, and lone wolf attackers have significantly enhanced their capabilities by gaining access to these technologies, Dr. Jayashankar said. They use technology and money and most importantly, the ethos of open societies to attack freedom, tolerance and progress, he said. Jayashankar said another add-on to the existing worries for governments around the world is the use of unmanned aerial systems by terrorist groups and organized criminal networks. The possibilities of using weaponized drones for terrorist purposes against strategic infrastructure and commercial assets call for serious attention by the member states, he said. Heads of delegations of the United Nations Security Council's Counter-Terrorism Committee, CTC, call on the President of India, Mrs. Draupadi Murmu, at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. The UNSC CTC delegation was in India to attend the special meeting of the UNSC CTC held in Mumbai and Delhi. Welcoming the delegation members, the President appreciated the gesture of commencing the visit by paying tributes to the 2611 victims in Mumbai. She said that India as the world's largest democracy, with one of the most open and diverse societies in the world, has been a victim of terrorism for decades. India has a national commitment to fight the evil of terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. She emphasized that zero tolerance to all acts of terror, irrespective of its motivations, should continue to be the guiding approach of the international community in shaping the global counter-terror art Architecture. During the meeting, Ambassador Ruchira Kamboj, permanent representative of India to the UN, in a capacity as chair of the CTC, informed the President about the working of the UNSC, CTC and its priorities. Mr. Michael Musa Adamo, President of the UN Security Council, and Foreign Minister of Gabon and External Affairs Minister of India, Dr. S. Jay Shankar, also made brief interventions apprising the President of the salient aspects of the UNSC, CTC's deliberations and the way ahead as outlined in the Delhi Declaration. Among the dignitaries who attended the meeting were Ms. Sharli Ayorkor Bochwe, Foreign Minister of Ghana, Ms. Reem Ibrahim Al Hashimi, Minister of State for International Cooperation of UAE, and Ms. Megi Fino, Deputy Foreign Minister of Albania. Senior officials of the United Nations, including Vladimir Voronkov, Under Secretary General, and United Nations Office for Counterterrorism, were also present on the occasion. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. For quick news updates around the clock, follow us on Twitter at AIR News Alerts. In Israel, people began voting on Tuesday for the fifth time in less than four years to elect a new parliament. Former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is bidding for a comeback. After years of a deadlock, voter exasperation may hurt turnout, but surging support for the ultra-nationalist religious Zionism bloc and firebrand co-leader Etemar ben has galvanized the campaign. Outgoing centrist Prime Minister Yair Lapid is also in the race. 
Israel's longest serving premier Netanyahu is on trial on corruption charges which he denies but his rightist Likud party is still expected to finish as the largest in parliament this will be the first time since 2009 when Mr Netanyahu is running to polls not as the incumbent prime minister as polls opened on Tuesday the final opinion polls from last week showed him still short of 61 seats needed for a majority in the 120 seat Knesset opening the prospect of weeks of coalition wrangling and possibly new elections security and surging prices have topped the list of voter concerns in a campaign triggered by defections from the unlikely ruling coalition of right wing centrist and arab parties formed after the last election the last four elections in israel ended in an indecisive mandate as alliances fell short of the majority mark in the knesset Polling stations across Denmark opened on Tuesday in a national election expected to change the Scandinavian nation's political landscape. This time, new parties are hoping to enter Danish parliament and others are seeing their support dwindle. At least 3 politicians are vying to become prime minister. They include Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen, who steered Denmark through the COVID-19 pandemic and teamed up with the opposition to hike Danish defense spending in the wake of Russia-Ukraine conflict. The other two are center-right opposition lawmakers Jacob Hellman Jensen, the liberal leader, and Soren Pap Paulsen, who heads the conservative. More than 4 million Danish voters can choose among 14 parties. Domestic things have dominated the campaign, ranging from tax cuts and a need to hire more nurses to financially support Danes amid inflation and soaring energy prices because of Russia's war in Ukraine. Neither the center left nor the center right is expected to capture a majority which is 90 seats in the 179 seat forketing legislature that could leave a former prime minister who left his party to create a new one this year in a kingmaker position with his votes being needed to form a new government a former liberal leader Lars Lokke Rasmussen created his new centrist party in June According to the polls his moderates could get as much as 10% of the vote he has hinted he could see a ruling coalition with the social democrats and could also be considered a prime ministerial candidate on the center right two new parties that want to limit immigration are bidding to enter parliament and may push out a third similar group that has had a key role in earlier governments by pushing for stricter migration rules without being inside a governing coalition among them are the denmark democrats created in June by former hardline immigration minister Inga Stoltenberg North Korea has asked the US and South Korea to stop their joint military exercises Washington and Seoul on Monday began one of their largest combined military air drills which will end on Friday North Korea's foreign ministry in a statement said that if the US does not want any serious developments not suited to its security interests it should stop the war exercises immediately North Korea has also launched a series of missiles in recent weeks in response to the exercises. The current military drills called Vigilant Storm involve hundreds of airplanes conducting mock attacks 24 hours a day. 50 United Nations member countries have issued a joint statement that condemned the Chinese government's persecution of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. The 50 signatories included the United States, Britain, Japan, France, Germany, Australia, Israel, Turkey, Guatemala and Somalia. The statement expressed grave concern about the human rights situation in the People's Republic of China, especially the ongoing human rights violations of Uyghurs and other predominantly Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. The statement was presented to UN member states by Canada at a meeting of the UN General Assembly's third committee which focuses on human rights. It was the largest group of states to publicly denounce Beijing's human rights violations in Xinjiang. In August, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights (OHCHR) released a report on human rights violations in China's western region of Xinjiang. The findings of the report concluded that under its anti-terrorism and anti-extremism policies, China was committing serious human rights violations. The International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists will be observed across the globe on Wednesday. The United Nations observed the day to condemn all attacks against journalists and media workers. In December 2013, the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed the 2nd of November as the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. The date was chosen in commemoration of the assassination in Mali of Claude Verlon and Ghislain Dupont, two French journalists, on the 2nd of November in 2013. 
In his message on the eve of the day, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres stressed that a free press is vital for democracy, exposing wrongdoing and advancing sustainable development goals. Mr. Guterres called on the governments and international community to take necessary steps to protect journalists. The UN chief noted that more than 70 journalists were killed this year for fulfilling their role in society. Marking the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists, which aims to create a safe and free environment for all media workers, Mr. Guterres stressed ending a common culture of impunity and enabling journalists to do their essential work. He observed that a surge in disinformation, online bullying and hate speech, particularly, particularly against female journalists, is contributing to the stifling of media workers around the world. The UN Secretary General said intimidation through the abuse of legal, financial and other means is undermining efforts to hold the powerful accountable. He said these trends threaten not only journalists but society as a whole. On the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists, Mr. Guterres called for taking a pledge to honour our media workers and stand up for truth, justice and human rights for all. Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina conferred the prestigious Friends of Liberation War honour on former US Senator Edward M. Kennedy posthumously in Dhaka. She conferred the honour for his contribution to the liberation of Bangladesh. The honour was handed over to his son, Edward M. Ted Kennedy Jr. Speaking on the occasion, Prime Minister Hasina said that Kennedy Sr. took a bold stand against the genocide committed by Pakistan on innocent Bengali people despite the U.S. government's role during the 1971 Liberation War. Recalling the strong opposition mounted by Kennedy Sr. against the U.S. government policy of supplying arms to Pakistan, Prime Minister Hasina said that Kennedy worked hard to stop U.S. military and economic aid to Pakistan till the end of the war. She recalled that Kennedy visited the refugee camps in West Bengal, where a large number of people from the then East Pakistan had fled to escape from army's brutality. The key domestic stock indices on Tuesday climbed more than half a percent amid positive cues from global share markets. The Sensex regained the 61,000 mark, while the Nifty declaimed 81,100 level. A report from the business desk. The Sensex rose 375 points or 0.62% to close at 61,121. The Nifty also gained 133 points or 0.74% to end at 18,145. At the global stock markets, Asian stock markets witnessed gains. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index surged 5.2%, South Korea's Kospi climbed 1.8%, and Singapore's Trade Times gained 1.2%. Japan's Nikkei 225 added 0.3%, while China's Shanghai Composite Index declined 2.6%. European shares were also up in intraday trade. Oil prices gain more than 1%. In intraday trade, Brent crude was trading at $94.10 per barrel. Back home at the multi-commodity exchange, gold futures for December was trading at 50,640 rupees per 10 grams. Silver futures for December was trading at 59,545 rupees per kilogram when reports last came in. In the forex market, the rupee strengthened 7 paise against the US dollar. The domestic currency closed at 82 rupees and 71 paise against the American unit. Veera Kumar for World News All India Radio. In cricket, England kept their semi-final hopes alive at the Men's T20 World Cup with a 20-run win over New Zealand in Super 12 stage fixture at the Gaba in Brisbane. The Fab Four of England, George Butler, Alex Hales, Chris Wokes and Sam Curran stepped up to deliver a much-needed win for their country. Chasing a target of 180 runs, New Zealand got off to a bad start as they lost their opener Devon Conway for three on the delivery of Chris Wokes. Glenn Phillip top scored for New Zealand with 62 of 36 deliveries, while skipper Kane Williamson scored 40 of 40 balls. For England, Chris Wokes and Sam Curran bagged two wicket seats. Earlier, opting to bat first, England was off to a great start. Skipper Josh Butler played a scintillating 73-run knock to power England to 179 for six in stipulated 20 overs. Butler blazed away to 73 of 47 balls, with the help of seven boundaries and two sixes. Besides the skipper, opener Alex Hale's 52 runs of 40 balls powered England to post a competitive sp score. For New Zealand, Lockie Ferguson picked two wickets. With the win, England climbed up to the second spot in the Group 1 points table. New Zealand, England and Australia have five points under their belt, but the Kiwis are placed at the top, followed by England and the Aussies on the basis of a better run rate. Earlier, in the other match of the day, Sri Lanka also kept their semi-final hopes alive with a six-wicket win over Afghanistan at the men's T20 World Cup in Brisbane. 
India will take on Bangladesh in the Super 12 stage encounter of T20 World Cup at Adelaide on Wednesday. The match will have a big role to play in the qualification chances of both the sides. So far, India have played three matches, winning two and losing one. Bangladesh have also won two and lost one. India, which is second in the points table, are above Bangladesh due to a better run rate. Weather may play small sport as Weatherman has predicted rain in Adelaide tomorrow. A victory over Bangladesh will make the march of men in blue to the semi-finals, while in case the match is washed off due to rains, it will throw open the contest for the second team from this group to enter into the semi-finals. The first annual G20 Religion Forum, R20 Summit, will be held at Bali in Indonesia on Wednesday and Thursday. The R20 has been recognized as an official G20 engagement group and the R20 Summit in Bali is the main event in this year's G20 program. President of Indonesia, Joko Widodo, is scheduled to address the opening session of this year's R20 Summit on Wednesday. As the ardent country will bring together the world's most economically powerful nations, the summit also brings an opportunity for both India and Indonesia to re enliven their historical and civilizational ties. The R20 summit will be hosted by India next year as the country, as the country India assumes the presidency of the group of 20 for one year from the 1st of December 2022 to the 30th of November 2023. Government of India's premier publishing house, Publications Division, will showcase its publications at a 12-day international book fair to be held at Expo Centre at Sharjah in UAE beginning Wednesday. The international book fair, being organised by the Sharjah Book Authority, will host a stellar group of award-winning authors, intellectuals and other literary luminaries from around the world. The theme of the year is Spread the Word. Continuing the celebrations of Azadi Kamrit Mahotsa, Publications Division will be offering the readers and book enthusiasts a wide variety of books on history of the Indian freedom struggle and freedom fighters. The readers will also get to explore more than 100 books and magazines in different Indian languages on various themes. Now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Financial Times in a lead item says, Banks prepare to hold $12.7 billion Twitter debt on books until early 2023. The Guardian writes that Brazil just orders police to clear roadblocks by pro-Bolsonaro truckers. The Wall Street Journal reports that China docks final module to space station. The Washington Post, quoting a report, says Russian neighbor Norway raises military alert after drone sightings. Japan Times informs that COP27 Climate Summit to test resolve of world battling war and inflation. And now a quick look at the headlines once again. India reiterates its firm commitment towards deepening multilateral cooperation in areas of food and energy security and climate change. SEO member states call for open, inclusive and non-discriminatory trading system based on principles of WTO. Indian President Draupadi Murmu calls for collective global efforts to address water crisis. Suspension of UN-brokered grain deal will affect food security globally, says India at UNSC. Grain ships leave Ukrainian ports despite Russian suspension of export deal. People in Israel vote in their fifth parliamentary election in less than four years. Polling also underway in Denmark for national elections. And in cricket, England defeat New Zealand while Sri Lanka beat Afghanistan in Super 12 stage fixtures of Men's T20 World Cup, India to clash with Bangladesh on Wednesday. And now before we end, let us listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan, by artists from Algeria. <laughs> Oh, 
And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with next edition of World News.